Welcome to Inside the Nation um, for 2019 season. This is episode number five. And this week's guest, I want to welcome AFL veteran, free agent, DB, wide receiver, return man, um, bringing back to the, the old school ways of the AFL, Mr. Christian Wise, Mr. Iron Man. How are you doing? Appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the show. It's good to have you. Yeah, and I want to bring that back to the point to maybe later in the conversation we'll get we'll touch that little Iron Man situation up and and thoughts about that and how it was the true integrity of this of this game that we love of the Arena Football League. Um so basically I just want to have you on and let's talk about you. Know, I know you're a free agent at present time. Um what your what's your I guess viewpoints of the league and its current status right now? Um well personally right now with the league uh from how it was maybe a, a year or two ago and how all the teams have basically defunct it and, you know, it was it became a shortage of jobs for veteran players like myself, depending on what region and, you know, side of the coast that teams were on, predominantly the East Coast because it's all the West Coast teams were gone. It was, um, was kind of tough. I, I knew coming back from China in 2016, I actually had a conversation with Sergio Gilliam and we were like, man, it's just... Uh, are we going to have jobs coming back home, uh, to be honest? And it, it was it really hurt because, you know, it was a lot of guys that um, were kind of lost out, out there and, and trying to figure out where am I going to play? I still have so much gas in the tank. I still have a hunger for the game. I want to ring, you yeah. know, and they, they all they know is playing. And then, you know, six months off, six months on. Um, now how it's coming back, I, I, I like the way where they're going in the direction of, you know, even making attempts of coming back with you know the expansion teams and you know having more jobs for guys to be able to have a place to play. Uh, I like how that I like the fact that Columbus kept the name the Destroyers because um, it has so much history and it has a lot of history to the game and it keeps a lot of integrity to the game of the Arena Football League. And I myself started watching when I was a little kid um, with the Anaheim Piranhas. Oh, so well, yeah. how far I go. With, with the game. Um, and at first I didn't really, uh, I didn't like arena football. I was like, ah, no, I'm not playing arena football. I'm going to the NFL. And, you know, when I got older, then it started, you know, I watched it a lot more and Kurt Warner and whatnot. And I like the way it's going because it's still giving guys in the States a chance to play football. And yeah. it's fun. And, you know, I still have so much love for the game in itself. And I still love the league. Okay. You, you basically touched base on my next question I was going to ask you is basically, how did you first hear about I know you mentioned the Anaheim Piranhas who were a transplant from Las Vegas Sting and they yes. were owned by um uh former mayor of South Cal City, um, David Baker, who later became the commissioner of the league. Um how'd you like um uh, watching that game and, and watching uh future AFL quarterback um and Mark Grebe there at the Piranha and Sam Hernandez and all that man? How'd you how'd you become involved? How'd you follow through on it? Uh, well, my uncle actually that played in the league himself, he played for the Rams and the Seattle Seahawks, uh, Sidney Justin. He was the one that took me and my cousins to the game. And I just thought it was crazy watching guys hit the wall, uh, flipping over the wall. I was probably about 12 or 13 at the time, maybe, maybe just turning 12. So playing Pop Warner football. And, um, I had mixed feelings after, at the end of the game as a kid, I wasn't sure if I, if I liked it a lot. Or if I was just like, this is just some type of entertainment. Uh, but as soon as I got the opportunity to play and step on the field and in the walls, it was, uh, I, I love the game. Uh, no question. Yeah, well, what was that key moment that you said you're bringing, now you're going onto the field, no longer a fan, but you're still a fan when you want to still play it because you have an interest in it. Um, what was that key moment that got you to say, okay, let me go ahead and look for a team that's in my area or if I have to travel, I have to travel and, and try out for the team. And which team was it that first got you onto their roster? Uh, well, I started out in the Deuce. And that was in, golly, 2008? 2008, 2008, South Georgia Wildcats, Coach Derek Stingley. He brought me in. I wasn't going to go to the workout. Uh, then something just told me, go. I drove from Atlanta down to Albany, Georgia, and it was at Albany State. The grass wasn't done. It was, like, high. Uh, went out there, worked out, ran about a 4-4 or 4-3, 4-3, I think, 4-3-8, something like that on, like, uncut grass. And yeah. I made the team. I didn't think I was going to get a call, to be honest. I wasn't sure. 
but I went back home to Los Angeles and a few weeks later I'm training at Dorsey High School and um, he gives me a call and he was like, uh, well, I told you that I actually want to bring you on for practice squad, but I made a mistake. Your college teammate is who I wanted to bring on practice squad. I wanted to sign you. And I was actually the only rookie that made it that year in the deuce. And we lost, we they beat Spokane, uh, beat Tennessee Valley, and Tennessee Valley won in the AF2 that year. And yeah. it was going into the year 09 where the league went bankrupt and it went deep, you know, it, it canceled. Um, I actually, um, sorry, excuse me. Um, I actually just, uh, I wasn't quite sure um, what, what I was going to do. I went out there and I wasn't sure what I was stepping into. I was around nothing but vets. Uh, PJ Berry, Bucci Ebay, Antoine, uh, Antoine Savage, uh, you know, a lot of guys that played uh, at a high level in, in the AFL and, and, you know, and in the deuce. And I learned from a lot of veterans and I made it through that year. And I took it into the next season, signing with the Albany Firebirds, which they brought back in 2009 after the season, um, the AFL season was done. I was going to go to the Voodoo, uh, where Sting was going to be at. And well, well, that's where it was looking like. And then basically everything just, uh, you know, blew up. And they yeah. <laughs> saw the here in Times Square, actually, AFL bankruptcy. I'm like, OK, so um, what am I about to do now? Uh, but uh, that was the first time that I actually got my first taste at arena football. And I was against the Daytona Beach Thunderbirds. So, like, well, that was my first touchdown. Wow. I yeah, I, personally, I didn't really follow the deuce too much because, of course, in my area in San Jose, we had the, the major league team, the Sabercats. But in 2009, when the season was defunct and the AFL still had their stake in that deuce, um, they still played that year. Um, the Sabercats, you know, the fan club, we sort of made ranks with the, at then the Los Angeles Avengers fan club. So the mm -hmm. rule of California kind of say, so they went with the southernmost AF2 team, which was the Central Valley Coyotes that played in Fresno. Yeah. <laughs> and then we went yeah. with, um, the Stockton Lightning, you know, so basically we went there and our first game was down in Fresno. So we had to travel down there. And of course, you know, our team, the Sabercats version of the team, Stockton, we won over the LA Avengers. And of course, the F Avenger fan club said, you guys always win, Sabercats. You cheat, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. So wow. we kept it going as a way to keep the fans interested in the league because we knew the league was going to come back. They were just trying to rebrand re themselves, you know, do a new business structure um, and all that stuff behind the grounds. And they just used, you know, the bankruptcy to clear things up for the for the business structure. Um but that's for a whole nother story. But we know that back in um, 2010 when the league relaunched itself, um, it didn't just say, okay, we're going to come back and we're going to try to bring back the major teams. They also welcomed back some of the AF2 teams, and they also had two expansion teams in the Jacksonville Sharks and the Dallas Vigilantes. Of course, you came back as with the Bossier Shreveport Battle yeah, Wings. Bo yeah, Bossier City. <laughs> Bossier City Shreveport Battle Wings. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a mouthful. It is. It was <laughs> – it was a, that was quite an experience too, absolutely, and that was nothing but super vets on that team. Yeah, uh, gosh, Ray Filia, James Jordan. Um, I mean, there was just so many guys. Nick Ward, who ended up coaching some years later. Um, there was a, a Kimani Jones. There was a lot of guys on that Bozier Shreveport team that was just pff, AFL vets, you know. And it was it was that was I could honestly say in the first few years I learned a lot in paying my dues, you know, yeah. from the type of players. I, per, I personally watched video on Will Pettis. That's, and he wasn't in the league then, but I watched the Iron Man, you know, him, um, who else? Uh, got Timon Marshall, who played for the Avengers, uh, Chris Jackson. Uh, those were a lot of the guys who I watched and I was like, the start of YouTube era. So that's how I kind of started watching videos on them and seeing how they played the game and then taking it and learning it because I didn't know how to slow down in arena football and just running full speed all the time and using the control because it was just all speed for me and beating them. Yeah. But that was when I learned little nuances of it and got, you know, on both sides of the ball. Um, that, that, that Bozier Shreveport team, we lost quite a bit of games that year uh which was kind of ironic because both the two top veteran teams were dallas and clint dozell was coaching that and i think that might have been his first year coaching yeah i think so yeah um and then our team bozier shreveport which was just 
racked up with veterans and both had a losing season, which was crazy. Uh, yeah. And I was going to ask you about um, how was it playing for a team that was coming up, trying to readjust it from being normally an AF2 team, a development league team, the the finances are smaller, the budget's smaller for a team because you're playing a small market. How was it for that team and as far as for, without going too much depth besides like the ownership before they transplanted and became the New Orleans Voodoo the next year, how was it as an operational standpoint? You know, was it treated sort of like a, at equal level for an AFL team from the AF2? Um, uh, really, it it really wasn't. It was still people feeling out where it was going. You know what I mean? Because it was the first year back. Um, I can't say that it really didn't feel like AFL until I was with um, uh, Kansas City. And that was because that team came back and they were already an AFL franchise. They kind of knew exactly what they were doing and how they kind of wanted to do things because they already kind of had a blueprint. Um, but yeah, Bowdoin Shreveport, <laughs> they still had they still had a little, uh, you know, deuce uh, tendencies yeah. to say. That. Um, so yeah, it was uh, it, it was it was kind of night and day going from Bozier uh, Shreveport <laughs> and going to the next year in 2011 with the Kansas City Command. Yeah. Uh, it was definitely a, a night and day experience. Yeah, I was going to ask you because I know unfortunately you didn't have a, a chance to migrate with the the, the battle wings and become a voodoo player the following year and make the trip from northern Louisiana down to south, southern Louisiana and become the voodoo. But you went up north even further to Kansas City. But you still had a transition you had to deal with there, not just because you're moving franchises but and, and cities and all that stuff, but you also had to deal with the fans themselves having to get used to the rebranding because I know when they first came on, they were technically still the, the, the brigade. Yes, um, the Kansas City Brigade, what they had the naming rights to, but the, for whatever reason, I guess from they say marketing wise, they wanted to rebrand themselves the the command at least from the name, colors, and the logo basically stayed the same, but they just wanted to do it. How was that transition from the fan standpoint? That and you know what, from the stand the the fans standpoint, they were confused. Not even gonna lie, which is why I'm glad that the Columbus Destroyers kept their name and you know their history because that's really what possibly could get the AFL back going if they were able to get their trademarks back with the old teams because that's what the original fans knew and understood have apparel all that stuff to them they're like okay well what is this it started out kind of like the AFL 2 AF, at the AFL 2.5 maybe you know what i mean it was like kind of just a half upgrade of what the deuce was um and it was, you know, going out and marketing and, you know, talking to kids and families and stuff like that. People would be like, well, what happened to the brigade? Well, we're, we're still the brigade, but we had a name change. They're like, oh, OK. So, it, you know, the marketing wasn't it, they tried, but it yeah. was really tough for them to bring their old fans in um, from how it was before. Yeah. How was it playing there at the Sprint Center? That was amazing. I mean, that was probably one of the best experiences next to playing for Cleveland. Uh, that I had uh, in the AFL. Uh, we had two arenas. We practiced at Kemper, and we had the home stadium at Sprint Center, and that was just us in there. Yeah. So there was it was new. There was nobody there. It was you know just us, and like you know, I'm on big digital billboards. I'm like, oh man, this is like this is what I've been trying to do. Like I'm trying to get some exposure so I can get to the league and you know try to brand myself. Um, and uh, it. it Kansas City was a great city. I would wish they would bring it back and bring the brigade back. They really had, if they had, if they had key marketing, it could be really be a thriving city there. Yeah, unfortunately, it can't be the brigade because that name's already been taken up by Baltimore Brigade. Right. So right. unfortunately, took it. And, and even when they came out with when um, Ted Leonsis came out and rushed into putting Baltimore on the on the field. And fielding that team, they rushed into calling it the brigade and all that stuff and took that branding away from Kansas City. It was kind of almost like a shot in the arm for the um, the Kansas City's ninth man saying that we might not come back to you guys. Yeah, um, you have to deal with these smaller indoor teams that come and try to go in and out of that city. So it's unfortunate because I know when the um, they were the brigade, even like in the first year or half the season, the first year, they had some great fans there. Um, so 
I know it was a Scott Stories was one of the the main guy there. That's a great him and his wife and family. They're great. They you know they they're great people. They they showed me so much love when I was playing for Kansas City for my two years until I went to Pittsburgh. Uh, they they've always been been great people, great fans to the league, and you know they've given a lot to the league. You know from yeah. Iowa to what Quad City. Every every team that's been around there, you know that in their in their vicinity, they've showed they've showed a lot of uh, support too. Yeah, and it's great. I met him a few times, and I ran into him um, at the post Arena Bowl party in um, in Glendale when the, the Arizona Rattlers had to move it outside of Phoenix to Hilton and Glendale for the Arena Bowl. Was it um, uh, what against, was it twenty nine? I think it was. Yeah, is that against Jacksonville? I was there. no, that was against um, that was against Philadelphia. It was uh, Philly. Rattlers versus Philadelphia. Philadelphia won. That's the first Arena Bowl that did not have the James Foster Trophy. They had a smaller duplicate. Because of uh, certain the situations Kano's of certain team keeping it yeah, the year nice. beforehand, <laughs> so now they're deciding yeah, to. <laughs> yeah, now they're deciding to do a whole new trophy and get rid of the whole trophy. What's your thoughts on that? While we're on, on the point of rebranding the or redesigning the trophy in general, and its traditional uh, history look for the league. I mean, that's that's. I mean, as a player, it, I, I would have loved the big trophy. You know that the one that up and walked away. But, um, you know, it's not like we can really keep the trophy as a player, you know, individually. Yeah. So really the rings that count. You know, we love to, to win the trophy, kiss the trophy. Nobody wants to win a micro mini trophy, to be honest. And uh, no shots at the other trophy that went out. But, you know, the rings are, are pretty much what's going to what's gonna show 10 years down the line yeah. for uh, a player like myself because um, I can't walk around with the trophy on, on my shoulder all day. Unless I get like a giant WWE belt or something like that. <laughs> man. Then I just wear that to bed, you know, and wear it everywhere. I'd, I'd take that over a ring any day as some iced out like that. I, you know, that's pretty cool. Trying to but, call call attention to Vince McMahon there, man. <laughs> there we go. Hey, the Vince, XFL trophy Vince, being a, a... Vince should have been invested into the AFL. He, he should have. I, mean, I know. I know. He th- he's probably thought about it. You know, even before yeah. the relaunch of the XFL. But of course, the way he is, he wants everything on his own. Well, everything is control. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. So, um, okay, we touched the base on um, you're going, and I know before we got on the trophy issue there um, with the design of thoughts. How was it transitioning going to the Pittsburgh Power and playing for the great Lynn Swan there, that who had part owner of that team? You know, it was it was fun playing for uh, Pittsburgh and for Mr. Swan. Um, you know, and he's a SC alum, and I'm from Southern California. I grew up a Trojan at heart. You know, uh, I was supposed to go there out of high school, and I had issues with the NCAA, and I wasn't able to stay for track and football. But I'm always going to be a Trojan and a diehard Trojan. Um, you know, it, it was it was really really cool to be able to meet him and you know somebody who's a legendary uh, football player like himself. Uh, and then that to be one of my bosses uh, was also pretty cool because he actually did interact with us, um, you know, like not even a lie playing for Cleveland, never even saw Dan Gilbert. And that was just like, I don't I'm not even sure any players that did uh, yeah. they saw his man. But, you know, even going to the arena ball, we were like, oh, OK, we might we might meet him. Yeah, no, that, he's busy. We're all, OK, cool. Well, all good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then that happened against Arizona. Uh, <laughs> so that. That was just the whole. That was 2014, but um, yeah, that was uh, Pittsburgh was a, a great city, great fans, uh, and uh, it was it was it was pretty cool playing out there. Yeah. So, would you say that would be a great city to go? I know they've done two year two teams this year for expansion with Atlantic City Blackjacks and the Columbus Destroyers. We think bringing back the and how they're doing it is like regional um, mm-hmm. expansion to try to create the rivalry. And I guess also the ticket flash pass for a season so that you could go to away games as part of your pass. Right. Um, do you think um, next year when the – so Paul, everything is saying now it's sketchy up in the air about Cleveland coming back. But I think they're still coming back because they're still operating in the background. Right. Um, right. But to come back and I don't know if Dan Gilbert will own a second team or he takes over Columbus or whatever. But to have Pittsburgh come back. So, you know, because you got Columbus two and a half hours south of Cleveland and you got – Pittsburgh being roughly around the same distance to a little bit of the east of mm-hmm. Cleveland. So that little tri area, tri state yeah. area. Yeah, absolutely. I think that would be great for Pittsburgh to come back. I think it'd be great for their fans to come back, you know, and have something there um, at the at the energy, if it's still called the console energy center. Um, but yeah, it was the, the, the city, the, the years I was, the year I was there and then second year, um, 
it was it was great. Uh, Pittsburgh was really cool, and they they treated us well um, as far as the the fans did and the support. And um, you know, I, I definitely had good times with uh, my teammates and my coaching staff there at Pittsburgh. I think your coaching was it Ron James there. No, I, actually Stingley was there. He took over oh. when uh, Siegfried got fired. Oh, okay. That was uh that was when I got traded from or actually I asked for my release from Kansas City because funny story, uh, Bardo, Coach Bardo, uh, great guy, he actually was letting go both quarterbacks on April Fool's Day, <laughs> and I don't, it, I guess everybody thought it was a joke at first, but no, he released both quarterbacks on April Fool's Day, asking me if I wanted to either be traded or I wanted to my release because front office was looking to go a different route after we lost to Arizona. They wanted the big. Six five receivers, you know, stuff like that. I was like, okay, well, um, get my release <laughs> so I can go where I at least want to go. Because <laughs> yeah. I know the NFL, and it's not like somebody's going to be paying me a whole lot more. I'm after at least I'm at, have to at least want to go where I'm comfortable. Uh, so I, I went to a good position with uh, Pittsburgh, and it worked out uh, going there. And yeah. we had a thirty point comeback actually, which was a record. Uh, my like first game. And I only played one play, and I ran a backside corner against Orlando, against uh, Coleman, I think his name was, a DB there. And that was a 31-point comeback. And uh, that was, like, my first start there. Yeah, so um, that's cool. Uh, so Pittsburgh would be a great market to come back. I know that, Pittsburgh, because I've, con- um, I've been chit-chatting on social media with the, the voice of Pittsburgh. There was a PA announcer by the name Dom Erico. Mm-hmm. Um, he he did a great job, you know, and I sort of, in a way, sort of say when you do your announcements, you know, invent, you know, say, hey, ninth man, you're Pittsburgh's ninth man, you know, in the public dress, you know, try to bring solidarity. I, I tried to do this with all the teams. Uh, unfortunately, it, it sort of didn't work here with San Jose on how they like to try to script things and be more corporate, right. you know, because we're in Silicon Valley, we have to be corporate here. You right, know, right. You can't be fan oriented, you know, but uh, even though the fan is your number one customer, you know. So, yeah, but basically, yeah, day. absolutely. Yeah. So, um, I could go on about some issues I had since but most of the part, I had great times because it brought to me where I'm at now trying to help still support this league, even though I don't have a team anywhere near me, you know? Right. So right. now even the, uh, in, in IFL team, well, technically, uh, IFL moved down to San Diego this year. So yeah, they got the strike force. They just, uh, Ryan Eckert, Eckert just actually got the gig there. He was with Spokane. Uh, he's going to be the GM there, I guess this week. Uh, and, uh, hopefully they can they can try to get something going. That would be good for the city of San Diego because they have no sports beyond the Padres. Yeah. Uh, well, they uh, also have the San Diego fleet. The fleet, excuse me, the fleet. They have yeah. the fleet, and then you have two teams in Arizona, Tucson and Phoenix. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah, so, Tucson. That's kind of sketchy, you know, when the yeah. GM and head coach of the Rattlers owns the other team down south. Tucson. Right. Right. Yeah. So that's kind of sketchy with that one, but um, but they needed an interstate rival with um Arizona to make it more. Adventurous for the league. Interesting, yeah, no question. No yeah, question. I actually tried to sort of try to uh, reach out to do PR and all that stuff for the San Diego Strike Force team and all that stuff and help them out with that. But yeah, I mean, can... you should now because they have a new, they have somebody new in the front office. So I mean, possibly could with, with Iker. Uh, he's he's a good guy. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure he'll love to see me when with all the trash talk I did with um, Spokane coming to our arena. Spokane, I, said, right. I had a I had to team up and try to compete with the the goal line bandits. You know. Right, right. Man, Spokane had such a – their fan base was – Yeah, so that when, while we're on the topic of Spokane, what, what's your thoughts about Spokane? And I know they got their naming rights for the Shock. So after they had to sort of like trade the Empire name out to become the Albany Empire, and then they got the league – the AFL gave the Shock back to the owner okay. of the Shock. So um, what's your thoughts of playing in front of Spokane's ninth man? Played against them and for them. Yeah. I'd much rather play for them. To be honest, that had to be the most trolling fan base that I've ever played against and played for in the league. And they just have the most amazing energy, uh, honestly. Like, for, for some fans to put into arena football, they had great energy. And definitely much love to them uh, out there in Spokane. Uh, I know it's kind of tough that they don't have the shock team there right now, but um, it's uh, they their, their fans were, were pretty dope. And me, when I played out there, they were they they welcomed me with open arms, even after playing, you know, of course, for so many years against them. Uh, and I had had my family out there with me, and it was uh, it was pretty cool. And they didn't know stats that you didn't even know about. You're like, how'd you know that about me? Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly, 
Exactly. Yeah, they knew everything. Yeah, they knew everything. You know, you know, I'm talking to our bet and everybody from the Sabercats when they went out there. They were just like, like, what's going on? How they know that? You know? Right. Right. So you know, player injuries that happened on Tuesday. I'm like, well, how do they know this? How do they know this guy is hurt? Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was pretty fun. So if, if the Arena League, because I know the Arena League needs to get um. As far as for touching base now, let's transition to um, talking about a little bit about expansion and the future of expansion. Uh, coming out, when they do come out west, um, do you see um, Spokane as being a key market to get back into in the shock and and doing the way that the league's doing, even though that the owner owns the rights to the shock name? I mean, it would be great for the league to be able to bring Spokane back. You know, and, and I mean, I think it would be great for them to bring back like Spokane, Utah, you know, Portland, those type of teams in that region, maybe not. I mean, I would love for LA, but you know, maybe not LA, maybe like, uh, you know, if Las Vegas, since they have a football team professionally now, you know, just that pocket of the Pacific Northwest going down, uh, you know, towards Arizona, I think it would be really good because there's so much talent on the West coast and everybody has to look to the South and the East coast now. And that kind of sucks as me being from Los Angeles, you know, if I wanted to play, I have to be on the East Coast or move far away where, you know, my family isn't at. Yeah, how, how was it playing for Portland? I know you played for an actual, what it would be if if any team comes back in the West Coast, it'll be sort of that model, but under new management, of course, with the league, the league owned Portland Steel. So how was it doing that, and how were the fans there, you know, coming over from being owned by Terry Emeritt and the Portland Thunder now to the Steel? Yeah, uh, and I, I met, you know, Mr. Emirate a few times. Really nice guy. Met him before I played, uh, you know, for Portland. Met him after and talked to him after when he wasn't the owner. And he still, you know, was uh, very receptive to, you know, was re- really, really nice. And any type of questions or any info or whatever, he would he would always, you know, reciprocate right back immediately. Um, he, he I, I think that with great ownership out there, they would, they would definitely thrive in Portland. And, you know, you have Nike out there, you have so much stuff out there as sports wise. It's really an untapped market in, in, in Oregon. Yeah. Like I, I, I liked Oregon a lot. You know, I was kind of hurt that they, you know, were done. And then playing for coach James, he was a really great guy also. And that was right before I went to China. Uh, so that's why it was just like, I wasn't sure what was going on. Excuse me. When I was coming back to the States uh, or where I was going to play. And so how was it um, going overseas and playing in it for the Shanghai Knights, I believe what they were called? Shanghai Skywalkers. Oh, Skywalkers. Okay, yeah. Shanghai Skywalkers. And uh, CAFL, man, That's it was like probably one of the best experiences in my life going over to China, just experiencing that. Yeah. Uh, it was so well done for it to be the first year, you know, officially, and how they had everything organized, you know, the uh, – Jaws had everything in, in uh, Derek Branch. Uh, you know, that whole team and staff, Ed Wang, all of them um, were, were, were top-notch. Had everybody on their P's and Q's. They were, you know, of course, nothing is perfect when you're starting out doing something like that, but there was really no issues. And for us to be so far from home, we didn't really have any issues with anything going on on, on that uh those few months that we were out there in China and I'm looking forward to going back actually this year doing the same thing. Yeah. I saw the player, um, the player auditions happening. I know that you tweeted it out cause you're heavy on your Twitter more than you're on yeah. your IG. So, um, I'm going to start getting back on my IG a lot more now and starting to post more. I, I, you should do all three, man. Twitter, yeah, IG, doing, Facebook, yeah, I Twitch. I do uh, YouTube, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, dabble in the, in the podcasting, uh, and and I'm, I really am an eSport gamer, so I'm on Twitch pretty heavy now and hey. just trying to get that up. Uh, we're, especially- we're on Twitch, too, here at Ninth Man Nation, too. We started out Twitch uh, towards the end of last year, and what we did is we launched a post-game live show on Twitch. Oh, awesome. So we're awesome. hitting, like, all the platforms. Like I say, you know, like, with this show, we're here on YouTube, and now we're also on Facebook. As of, yeah. I was going to keep Facebook as a separate show, uh, which is going to be doing on Tuesday. It's called our Facebook Q&A live stream. It's going to be a live stream Q&A. For the fans to be interactive and have questions, and then this shows on Fridays, and then we're going to do the post game live on Twitch. So we're everywhere. Nice, absolutely. You guys got to follow from me. I, I'm gonna follow you on Twitch for sure. Okay, the same handle, Ninth Man Nation. So we we got it all on all, all okay. platforms. My, my pretty much the same. C C W I five E on, on Twitch uh, TV. So yeah, absolutely. I will definitely be on that. I've changed my Twitter handle 
and my Instagram handle is Christian Wise, but Christian underscore W one S E. So it'd be like kind of easier for with that. Been doing C Wise for a minute, but um, I thought I was going to change it around this year. Okay, so let, let me go ahead. We've been on for a little bit. I know you know the video part could get long for people to watch and sit, and that's why I do the podcast version so you could take it along with you. Listen to your car. If you have like a, a smart home um, thing, like with Alexa or Google Home, you can listen to us on there to by requesting inside the nation. Um, let me go. What's your thoughts of you know if you were to have as a current moment your choice of any team in the, in the league right now, who would you play for and why? Whew. Well, uh, now are you saying football wise or personal business wise? <laughs> Personal business wise or personal football wise, you know, if you had to go with any organization right now that's out there, uh, you know what? I uh, I'm I'm not 110 percent sure because I'm not sure how Baltimore and Washington operate. I you know I'm familiar with Philly uh, because I, I I know how they operate there and I know how their front office operates and they're just. You know, they're pretty top notch and, and pretty on it with, you know, all the ownership groups that they have affiliated with, with their their, uh, their team and Jaws and Cosmo and all them guys up there. Um, AC would be great because I'm originally from New York and I know Coach James, you know, Sergio and, and Ray and all them guys up there. You know, it's uh, I think they're going to have something special. And also Warren Smith I played with him for some years, too. And he's a really, really good quarterback. I've been, you know. Uh, he, he gets a lot of high praise from me, um, but uh, if, if I had to choose a team, oh, man, I would probably say maybe Washington, okay. and, and I would probably say the Valor um, from a player standpoint and a business standpoint, uh, because I know how heavy they are with um, on the business side with branding and what they have going on, and also as far as a full. Uh, a full circle of, of possibly, you know, of how, how teams possibly should be ran and what the business aspect of it, you know, and, and probably be comfortable because it would seem more of something well put together. Uh, you know, the expansion team stuff, I've done that. So it's kind of rough, yeah. uh, you know, rough starting out with an expansion team because there's so many highs and lows that you're going to go through. Um, uh, Philly would be great too, but I, I would probably say the Valor. I, I would I, I would look at them, you know, as, as heavily if I, if I was offered a uh, contract with them. I and think... their owner is an esport guy too. Yeah. So he owns an NBA 2K league team with the Wizards with the District Gaming. So I'm like pretty heavy into uh, into esport gaming also. So. Yeah, he's doing that with the hockey too. With yeah, the, and... with, yeah, with the Capitals. So um, and he has an esports arena that he's built up there in DC. So right. um. So basically, they'll be incentivized because if you were, so let's say you get there and you get picked up by the Valor, and you're there, you're suited up for a, their home opener, which will be two things: one, the unveiling of the banner, because they just won the Arena Bowl, and then two, not I don't think they'll do it publicly, you know, and and at the game day because it'd be kind of hard, you know, getting the rings out there and then rushing them back to be stored, but the rings, you know, presentations to the players that are right. they're returning from you know last year's season. So would that if if you were there if you were to go there and see that would that give you a little more incentive to that's that's, that's extra motivation because that's what I want I want that ring before I'm done with my career and I set in a fifty yard dash you know Ray and that's my guy Alvin Ray Jackson you know we we we, we did that and when um and, and Ben who who helped put that together basically created it with me you know after I gave him that gave the idea like and and just uh from the beginning of it man I I want that ring that's yeah. what I want. Well, I'm done with my career. I want that championship. I want a ring. I want to be able to, you know, to 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 be etched in the in, in the AFL history. You know, I watched, uh, you know, the the touchdown Eddie Browns. Met him, his family, you know, his his son Eddie Jr. and uh, Antonio, and you know, met Chris Jackson. You know, got to pick his brain a little bit. You know, seeing the the I, I came from the history of the game before you know all of the stuff happened in, in 08 and, you know, 09 and all that stuff. I watched that and actually was into that, you know, I mean, actually a fan of the game before I was playing. So to, to be able to do something like that, I, uh, you know, really want to be one of the last Iron Men to be able to do it, you know, like Emo, like Eddie Moten, you know, and, and, and Pettis and, and those type of guys. You know, Barry Wagner. Able, Barry Wagner. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
I can't forget Barry Wagner for sure. Yeah, so that now that you brought that up, um, I was going to say that to the end, the Iron Man thing and your history with the league, both as a fan pers- uh, perspective and also as a player perspective, and that you participated. You know, you have a good stats with you know being on the offensive side of the ball. You have good stats to be on the defensive side of the ball, and then you also have you know good stats returning the ball and kickoffs and special teams. How is your um, thought about? the league not being Iron Man right now, but maybe possibly making the transition to go back to the Iron Man play. Would that be good for the league? I think it would be awesome for the league, to be honest. And, and it, it 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 gives an insurance policy also because you have a player who can play both sides of the ball so you can bring in extra linemen, you know, to protect your quarterback. Um, that's that's a, that's a key thing, you know, in, in numbers. Somebody who knows both sides of the ball, that means that he knows the game. And that means he actually is somebody who is a student of the game, you know, and knows what it knows to what to expect. You know, Alvin Ray Jackson, he's a he's he's definitely an Iron Man himself because he can play receiver, yeah. if need, you know, and, and and line him up on both sides. And he's been doing it his whole career also. Um, but there's only so few. It's it's very, very minute. Um, it would be huge for the game to bring it back because it's something that's not done it's original and it's one of the etch you know it's something that's been etched in stone in the arena football game you know that iron man is the position you know you don't i don't know any other uh sport that has that like i i know if iron man you're 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 that dude if you're an iron man player on that team yeah so that's good i i personally think that you know that to bring back some of the integrity in the game is to go back to iron man i know it transitioned out when I guess you could say the league allowed some of that NFL ownership to come in and they started trying to make it more the NFL indoors so they could train the players to go outdoors and, and they ruined – that's basically was the start of the decline of the integrity right. of the game and taking away from what James Foster had originally drawn up on that manila folder back in the day Manila's in the folder, 80s. Exactly. Yeah, I, I saw that folder. Not the original one, but he had a copy in. I met Mr. Foster and he was – one, he's tall because I'm six one myself. You know, right. and he's like probably like six four or six five, and it was, it was just great. You know, seeing the history and he and he appreciated what I was doing for at the time as be, just being a fan club president and mm-hmm. promoting. And he saw how much um, I was doing using the transition of using social media, which was just starting out popularity at the time. But I had a website that was probably compared to probably to none of the best of the the teams at the time at their websites. And all that stuff, and how much content I was trying to push onto the website that I was permitted allowed to by the by the team here. So, right. but but with that said, it was great. It was it was a great history, and, and bringing that history back is what the league I think really needs to. And their and their elimination of the one minute uh, warning now this year, and going to the thirty second warranty in the fourth quarter only. I think that's kind of dumb. I mean, I'm gonna say dumb, but you know because you're trying to bring fans back into the, especially if you're yeah. trying to recreate, uh, we go back to like the cities like Columbus and rebrand. And I know. I've checked out. They have the naming rights for the Grand Rapids Rampage locked up, which they registered the same day they registered Columbus Destroyer. So that's not trying to hit and everything for next year and all that stuff. Right, right. The return of Cleveland and that general Detroit is supposed to come into the league too after their two year test of the new Little Caesars Arena. So, but that's another whole situation there. Um, But basically, yeah, just getting back to traditional arena football, that's what this league needs to do. And then you can also bring into, you know, the the so-called gaming aspect of it, too. Yeah, they need a video game. I mean, gosh, there wasn't mobile phones, video games like that, and apps like that back then. I mean, you can basically play NFL Blitz on your phone right now with the same type of graphics that the arena football video game on PlayStation 2 is, or was. You know, you can do that on your mobile phone. You can do fantasy football right off your phone you know if 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 you want to have updated rosters you could just have the app update the rosters right there for each year on you know on an arena football app video game or even a console i think it'd be great for them to bring that back especially marketing you know even if it was having kurt warner come back gosh i mean you know you have so many nfl coaches now that you know or former players or former coaches that are in the nfl you know that can back it you know, Matt Nagy, I mean, Gruden, you know, uh, Muncie, O'Hara. It's so many, you know, even Chris Jackson now it being with the, you know, in the, in the league now. It's like, why aren't you using the history of it to promote yeah. what, what, it, what it was and what it should be instead of going to these new era? Dude, I look at the transaction wires and I just scratch my head sometimes. Like, oh, okay, they're doing it again where they're just going to sign and cut guys that haven't played or 
not going to even get to camp and then they figure it out week two after they see what do we have here from camp, training camp, um, which is kind of crazy because you said you have so many vets, you know, that just are kind of tired of being in the wind waiting, you know, and, and when you have viable guys that you can really call on right now and they just don't either want to do it for some reason, whether it's the financial aspect of not wanting to pay the veterans, you want to pay the rookies or, you know, however it however that is right now but um i think they really need to go back to the history of what this game is and where it came from in order to uh you know thrive and you know it's not good to go backwards but in some aspects this is probably one that would be good to go backwards to what it was yeah to um to add stability to the league also uh, um going back to talk about going backwards how about going back to where I know we're in the second year of a, a four-year deal with the CBA right now that's going on. What do you think about going back and expanding, not having players have to be free agents at the end of the year, but to have maybe the teams to be able to sign, say, like a, I don't know, like a five-year deal, right. and then the players will now know they have stability in that in that city, and then they don't have to worry about, okay, the, the season's over, so now I have to go and pack up and move back to wherever hometown they may have come from. But now if they had a five-year deal – they could go and say, well, okay, I'm here for a few more years. I can have some stability in this city, like say like for Columbus, for example, and then set footprint and then be able to do community outreach through the off season. And how do you think that would work better for the league? I think that's what the league needs because um, prime example, when I was in Kansas City, I was there and I got hurt in KC my year and I was there the whole year. So, you know, while I was hurt, I was still going out, doing interviews, doing community stuff. Uh, you know, they brought in one of the Chicago Rush's uh, PR people. And then we were going out doing the high school games and all that, which they weren't doing at first their first year. You know, and uh, I think community outreach and community service and, you know, events for the community and the city, that is what's key and what brings out the fans because they can interact with the players. They can interact with the coaches. You know, they can interact with the front, with the front office and their home team Yeah. as they can't interact with the NFL team. They're not going to interact with their NFL players. They're not going inter- to interact with them. They only see them basically through a, you know, a, a glass window. Uh, and which is probably why media is so quick to, uh, uh, go at their superstars, you know, heads uh, if something happens because they're trying to generate some type of news to even stay relevant, i.e. the Kansas City Star, like how they went after, you know, a, a, a recent player uh, with with him and his uh, his child, which is kind of crazy. You know, it's like you they're fishing for information because they don't really have anything right now. And yeah. it's like, you, you know, you need to start being one with your community and your team, which is what the AFL needs to do because it's supposed to be for the fans. It's supposed to be for the families, you know, family, fun, fast, you know, friendly. Yeah. And and, uh, that's what the league, from what I know, I'm sorry. And what it, uh, and what it was. Okay. So let's, I know that was a little bit more serious note. So I want to sort of end this conversation on a little bit lighter note with you. Now that you, we sort of had our last point. It was a little bit more on the serious side. Let's, let's try to end our conversation for today on the lighter note. And also yeah. give you and also give you a plug and welcome some of the new fans that may have not known that you've done this, but people know that you're in the the film industry, whether you're in front of the camera or behind the camera. But this time you were in front of the camera in a in a in a, um I can't think of the word, but um um what do you call it? I can't remember the, the terminology, but you were being interviewed with Alvin Ray Jackson on Fifty Yard Dash, the debut of Fifty Yard Dash with Fratnow Films and. Mr. Ben Fratnow, who now does co-hosting of AFL Tonight podcast, and he does a good job there with John Stark and Tim Capper. But um, how was your experience with that? And I'm going to try to get a little drop. I know it was, it was a few years ago that that actually happened, and I pushed it hard. It was it was awesome. I, I mean, you know, being able to work with Ben, and I've known him since he was young because I met him first when I was playing for the Albany Firebirds, and would give him tickets to the game, stuff like that. And they started up a YouTube channel for the fans. And that's how the marketing and stuff was going. And then, you know, he ends up going to film school and graduates, and then becomes a great filmmaker. It was just like everything coming together full circle when we did 50 Yard Dash, and it was just it was awesome. If people haven't seen 50 Yard Dash, please check it out. Uh, please follow them and you know and Ben and his work uh, he's, he's doing a great job and I'm very very proud yeah I want to I'll give a shout out um, um sorry oh, sorry sorry, sorry. Uh, 
to head out to my meeting. Oh, okay, yeah, well, just real quick, I'll give a shout out. I'll have that link to your particular episode uh, down below in our description. So, but I want to yeah. thank I want to thank you, Christian. I know you you said you have to head out, and we ran longer than anticipated in this conversation. But thank you oh, for yeah. heading out, and we hope to see you on the AFL field really soon. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. I appreciate it. All right, have a good day. You too. All right, take it easy.